that was the Haka. Uruguay faced it and they accepted the challenge. I didn't see anything particularly different from the way that they stood and faced it. They said it was something special. Maybe it was just a special moment for them. Absolutely, as always, facing the Haka. Um, you know, you're in the big time. If you're standing in front of it, you've succeeded. You're playing for your country. So, superb moment for these Uruguayan players. They've been obstinate in this tournament so far. They've really shown that in the breakdown particularly they're going to be they can be a handful for any team they're going to have to be at their absolute best tonight to slow New Zealand down but they are completely and utterly committed to making the most of this experience as you were saying to me before Sarah some of the stuff you've been reading in the week about what a privilege is it is to be here against the All Blacks and they're not going to miss a minute Let's quickly run you through that New Zealand lineup. Nine changes for them to the side that the Italy. Damian McKenzie wears 15 on the wings. It's Will Jordan and Lester Fano Anuka. Into the centres, Anton Leonard Brown and Jordi Barrett with Richie Moanga and Cam Roygaard who make up the halfback pairing. Into the forwards, Afar Tungafasi continues at one with Ethan De Groot still. Uh, banned at the moment after he got a red card against Namibia. Cody Taylor at two, Tyrell Lomax at three. The second row is Sam Whitelock, who I said earlier. He's at 150th cap today, but also his 23rd appearance at a Men's Rugby World Cup is now a record. Tupai Vai is in the second row with him with Shannon Frizzell, Sam Kane, who captains with seven on his back, and Luke Jacobson in the back row. Onto the bench then, Takie Aho, Williams, Newell, Barrett as in the Scott variety, Blackadder Christie, another Barrett is in Bowden, and then Clark make up the bench for the All Blacks. Our referee Wayne Barnes then is just waiting to get proceedings underway here. A reminder, this is Pool A, so France topped the pool. They've got 13 points. Behind them in second are New Zealand with 10 points. Italy in third also with 10, and then Uruguay in fourth with five points. New Zealand need to win this with a bonus point, and then Italy, it will essentially come down to their result against France, but they'd have to overtake France in the table. So we'll worry about that when that happens tonight. It's all about New Zealand and what they can do. It's going to be Uruguay who kick us off. They're traveling from right to left in this first half as you wait for Echeverry to get us underway. You're listening to Five Sports Extra coming to you live from the World Cup. Four days of pool action before we head into the quarterfinals. Ball taken then by the All Blacks inside of their own 22. Roy Gard, of course, still only 22 years old, who's uh, just waiting to get rid of this ball at the back. So much excitement about his potential. Is he going to be the one anointed to take over that nine shirt permanently from Aaron Smith when he finally does decide to hang up his boots? Ball goes out of play on the far side. It's from that box kick from Roy Gard, and we're going to have a Uruguayan line out 10 metres inside of all black territory. Respectful start from the Kiwis. Got their pot up early. Vai took the catch. Clear to touch from Roy Gard. First opportunity for Uruguay to try and get away first phase. Kessler gets the ball in. It's a well-worked line out by the Uruguayans who have been incredibly physical in their matches. Don't forget they really upset the French when they played their opening match against them. They denied France a bonus point. So they do have potential within them so much excitement at this world cup about what the south american sides have brought to the tournament taken forward this time by manuel licander plays a bit of rugby at bayon so we'll be in familiar territory here in france today and then bianchi also goes forward the uruguayan back row and they've gone over into the all black 22 now this is strong stuff from uruguay they're stringing together a number of phases and they're holding on to their ball they're having to commit a lot of men to the ruck to hold on to it but so far in New Zealand, they're not really contesting too much. It pushes towards this near side. Rodrigo Silva, who's got his first start for Uruguay of this World Cup campaign in what is uh, expected to be their final match. I should say there is a permutation where Uruguay do qualify for the quarterfinals, but life is short, and I'm not going to explain it all now. <laughs> but if the floodlights go out, you can start talking about that. <laughs> I will do, exactly. Right then, ball comes forward, a nice work through there. Fortunately, the ball spills to the floor. It went backwards, says referee Bain, Wayne Barnes, but it is still going to come up on the New Zealand side. So all of that effort by Uruguay over the last minute is lost. And of course, the All Blacks send it down the field as they exit from the 22. And this is going to be not a 50-22. Bounce of the ball denied that for the All Blacks. It's sent back with kind in the end by Echeverry towards the halfway. And... Uh, they're just checking that it wasn't taken back at 22. No, it definitely wasn't. So it's going to be an all-black line-out, 10 metres inside the Uruguayan half. It was good from Uruguay, wasn't it? From the, They won their line-out at the back, didn't quite get it cleanly, but broke through the line. Then many, many phases of play before the all-blacks got their mitts on it. 
Taken forward now by Jordi Barrett. The only Barrett on the field at the moment as the ball goes down to play. Fana Anuku, he's uh, trucking up forward. You might see him at centre tonight, such as the combinations that they've got available coming off the bench. Turnover ball here for Uruguay. And I can guarantee to you the player at the bottom of that will be Manuel Adeo. Now, a lot of excitement around him. He's the blind side for Uruguay. At the moment, his breakdown work at this World Cup has been incredible. Six steals so far. Um, and he's hit around 32 defensive rucks along the way as well. So he, he's got a, and a couple of penalties for Uruguay as well. So he's really been a standout player for them. And as the ball goes high into the air, box kick coming in by Arata. And it's taken in the end by Damian McKenzie, who, of course, we said for the All Blacks tonight is wearing 15. Now, he's not worn 15 since November 2021. And there's a knock on there from New Zealand. Ball spilt on the floor and Uruguay get it back inside of the All Blacks half. And we get to see a scrum as a result. All Blacks there on the front foot looking to get the offload away. No longer flat to the line. Then they just spilled it. Arata, the scrum half, Uruguayan scrum half. Alive to the opportunity. He's alive via the Uruguayan number nine. Potential future in France ahead of him. Yeah, we were talking about that on the way and there's a lot of excitement about Santiago Arata. He plays his rugby at Cast. And he is the one who is rumoured that uh, could be moving to Toulouse when Antoine Dupont takes a sabbatical from 15s to go and play for the French 7s outfit uh, in the build-up to the Olympics. Of course, Paris 2024 is closing in. They want the big stars playing. Could Arata be the one to step up? Now, there's a little bit of treatment going on at the moment to Tyrell Lomax, the Hurricanes tight head. Um, he's having his knee taped up. So what better way to taste the dodgy knee than go straight into the front row of a scrum? Now, what were you saying about Uruguay qualifying for the... <laughs> <laughs> you don't uh, want to talk about... Sports. Hopefully it won't be that long. Okay. Uh, the break, he's just getting a bit of strap into his right knee. The Kiwi tight head. Obviously, with with where they are in the tournament, the, the changes that Ian Foster has made, the size of the potential quarter-final, everybody's still playing for a position. Yes, there'll be one or two players who absolutely know they're, they're nailed on for New Zealand but you've got to put your hand up every time you get to go it's not an out and out second team it is a blend of players there there will be opportunities to put your hand up tonight one of those will be in the scrum I'm sure uh, Opa Tunga Fassi doesn't want to give up that number one shirt to Ethan De Groot when he comes back from his ban so expect the All Blacks when they get into the set piece to really try and put the squeeze on the Uruguayan eight well, it's New Zealand nil, Uruguay nil. We're approaching four minutes here in this Paul A match. I can tell you that New Zealand have around 60 uh, kgs more in weight when it comes to this scrum compared to the Uruguayans as they're going to pack down just inside of All Blacks territory, pretty much in the centre of field. Um, but Uruguay, they have packed out on the right-hand side of the field. Yeah, you, Uruguay ball. They've got five players to the right-hand side of the scrum with about 40 metres to work in. One player out to the left-hand side. Potential for a one-on-one -on -one if they swing it left. Well, the one-on-one -on -one will be with Will Jordan, who is facing that exact situation now. And Will Jordan's dealt with that very well. He saw Nicholas Freitas coming straight towards him. But it's still Uruguayan ball who are attacking once again inside of the New Zealand half. And we have definitely spent more time inside of New Zealand territory than we have Uruguayan. A slow start by all black standards when you have to remember their last outing was 96 points to 17 against Italy. So, still South American ball. And they're just attacking down this near side left channel. They bring it back towards the middle of the park. This time they're using Matteo Sanguinetti. Playing a bit of rugby at the moment at the Houston Sabercats as he tracks forward, looks for a little bit more work. Now there's a big arms of Luke Jacobson going over the top there. Referee likes it, so Jacobson did really well there. Moanga slightly out of place there to take that ball, has to almost spin backwards. I don't think he was expecting that as it pushes out towards the far side wing. So New Zealand ball now. 
And they're trying to exit from their own half. They're on their own 10-metre line for the time being. Little chop over the top, chased by Jordan. Jordan's still going. He's got Mackenzie with him. It's really nice. Uruguay need to make a tackle. They're just watching Jordan run at them. Too much respect being made there to Will Jordan. And it's still 10 metres now to travel for the All Blacks to get their first try of the match. Eventually, it's gathered by Barrett. He pushes out. Good support arriving for him. Seven metres left to the try line. All Black ball. Mawanga now. He managed to push it back. Now, referee Wayne Barnes is bringing it back now. Net roll. Net roll at the breakdown, and it's going to be a Uruguayan penalty to exit. Why didn't anyone tackle Will Jordan? Uruguay are always going to be vulnerable from the turnover. The All Blacks, the absolute masters of the counter-attack. Once Luke Jacobson had got his hands on the ball and, and, and ripped it free, the pass went to a deep Richie Moonga, who was coming from a defensive position. They moved the ball wide. And a nice break up the middle after the chip. Will Jordan. Will Jordan had one supporting player. Damian McKenzie ran the switch line. He didn't give it to him, which meant he was on his own. Just put the hammer down. I'm not sure they didn't tackle him. They potentially for about 25 yards yeah. couldn't. Um, but brilliant competition. And it was uh, it was Jacobson, the Kiwi number eight, who caught the defensive player a little bit high. Referee right to give that decision. But we're going to see plenty of that. If Uruguay are happy to play with the ball, as soon as the All Blacks pinch it, excitement levels will go up. Well, Uruguay overcooked their line out. They're just about holding onto the ball, but this is going to be seriously messy because they've lost about 10 metres in the process. So they bring it back towards this near side. They're now sort of like cuddling down this near side left touch to try and get themselves out of trouble. They've done well to hold on to it, but the All Black pressure will no doubt begin. So in goes Arata. Just looking for a little bit more support to arrive so he can try and maybe Caterpillar this one away he's caught at the back napping that's the sort of play that you don't expect from a player who's got reasonably decent calibre so stuck in there once again no scrum half for the time being so someone from Uruguay is going to have to play the ball All Blacks thought it was out then in the end it goes from Dotty. he makes his way forward now a lot of these Uruguayan players you'll hear that they play for the Penarol now that's the Super Rugby Americas team uh, which is the uh, tournament that was introduced by World Rugby as we finally get turnover ball there for New Zealand, it gets spat out towards the halfway line. In here they come in full flight. This is looking good. What a wonderful count here from the All Blacks. Push out to our far side. Surely a try coming in by Leicester. Fana Anuka. He's eventually dragged down to the floor. Five meters to go. Barrett is there. As is Sam Kane. One meter left to travel. Better from the All Blacks. Surprised they didn't go over. And the first occasion of asking spun around the side. Eventually it's Roygaard who goes over. And it's taken a few minutes, but eventually they are in business at this World Cup in this final pool match. Nearly eight minutes played, New Zealand five, Uruguay now. Exactly what we just talked about, Sarah. Tight to the left-hand touchline. Uruguay get turned over. The ball's immediately moved away from the, the scene of the steal. Moonga coming in from that backfield position again to set the counter-attack off. Moves the ball to Damian McKenzie. The Uruguayans are already in retreat, so... Mackenzie straightens up, engages the defenders. Two quick pairs of hands. Nice from Leonard Brown. Out to his left winger. And then one charge to the line. One quick breakdown. Kiwis all over the field. Uruguay still retreating. Camera Oigard pace out of the blocks there. You say a potential replacement. As actually, we're just having a little review. Wayne Barnes is looking at whether the ball was slightly dislodged before um, Roigard got it down. Well, I apologise, we can't hear Wayne Barnes at the moment. They are just having a little bit of a look into that. But yes, it looks like uh, the Uruguayan player managed to slightly dislodge the ball. It was in Roy Gard's hand, so has he knocked it on? I'd say from that angle, it looks like he has. Yeah, looking for separation between uh, the All Blacks player and the ball. Uruguayan ke hand came in, trying to affect the tackle, definitely made contact with the ball. It looked like it was dislodged. No try. Wayne Barnes agrees. And for all that good work and an opportunity to score the try, Roigard just, it was brilliant rear guard defence from, uh, from Uruguay. He'll be upset that he didn't finish that though. So, eight minutes played, New Zealand nil, Uruguay nil. Uh, take about Uruguay for just managing to get a, a little bit of purchase on that ball and just making sure it stopped. It was actually their loose head. Um, he sort of... I, I want to say he did it on purpose. I'm not entirely sure he did, but hey, who cares? He was there. It happened. He did it on purpose or not. Saved a try. Mate, Brilliant Mateo from Sanguinetti. Sanguinetti, yeah. yes. Take about. And uh, we have got a change there. 
Now, I don't think, I think that's a permanent change for New Zealand as well. So Tyrell Lomax has gone off the field of play and that means that Fletcher Newell is on in his place. That's an early change for the All Blacks as there's a big collision from the restart and uh, the All Blacks are attacking now just inside of the Uruguay in 22. Rogar going in looking for quick ball. Will he get his try eventually? Nil-nil here in Lyon. You can see that sort of mazy running line that we frequently see from Sexton for Ireland trying to be executed there by McKenzie. Not on this occasion. Uruguay were alive to the opportunity. Roy Gard looks up again, standing at first, receives a big uh, knock on there by New Zealand. Now, you don't see that often. Cody Taylor just couldn't take the ball there. Big bounce off him. We're playing advantage to Uruguay. Wayne Barnes giving them an opportunity to exit from the 22 without a scrum. But I have to say, Uruguay, they run out of these 22, so we could be here for a while. Wait till we see the replay, Sarah. But I, I think Cody Taylor's just pulled a Joe Marler there. Taken one straight on the forehead because Wayne Barnes hasn't signalled a knock on. No. It was a missed pass from Geordie Barrett. I think it hit him square between the eyes. Well, that'll be why Wayne Barnes' arm isn't out for the time being and Uruguay are trying to exit from their 22. Now, this is something, as I said that uh, they tend to run the ball, and it's what we've seen from a lot of the South Americans. And when I say a lot of them, I mean as in Chile and Uruguay. And uh, as we see that box kick go up, McKenzie is alive to it inside of the All Blacks half. He goes over the halfway, tries to deploy a little bit of footwork. Uruguay say no. Five metres inside of the Uruguayan half, he goes down to the floor. This time we see Shannon Frizzell of the Highlanders going forward. Of course, he was a, had a little bit of a knock early on in this tournament, missed the opening game, but is now back in position. And I think the All Blacks are very happy that he's back as well as it comes towards this near side. Anton Leonard Brown of the Chiefs just making his presence known, trying to build up on that combination with Geordie Barrett. Will Jordan goes in to play scrum half on this occasion. Oh. And that isn't well, if a, a fire tongue of Fassi wants to hold on to that number one shirt, moments like that where he just grabbed the ball and threw it to absolutely no one behind him is not going to help his cause at all. That was quite poor. Marginally hung out to dry by Richie Moonga there. Moonga had overrun him. They're looking for a circle ball. As, as you just said, a la Johnny Sexton. Moonga was about three yards out of position. So his, his prop forward will not thank him for that. And we've got turnover ball again here for Uruguay. Advantage as well. The arm goes out from Wayne Barnes. And it's Uruguay who are down on the ground trying to once again work their way out of their own half. So... They have spent quite a lot of time in the Uruguayan half of the field, but they've been stuck just for a little bit as the ball just slows down hugely there. Oh, what a bit of gas being put on now by Gaston Vieres. Oh, this is wonderful stuff. He's got support on his shoulder. It was the fullback who was there as well. He knocks on the ball again as eventually brought down by Cody Taylor. It was Silva who thought he got away with it. A bit of magic there. We might have lost a Uruguayan player in the process as we can still see that Silva is down injured. And a big... Hit out on the far side, charged down. They've got numbers on this near side, Uruguay. They're just trying to pull it out wide. Is it going to be a Uruguay try? Okay, it's down in the corner, touched down by Manuel Ardeo. But has it been given yet? Were his feet in? The touch judge straight away has gone to Wayne Barnes and they're going to check. Who cares? Listen to the crowd. <laughs> oh my goodness. We were saying last night, oh, you weren't here last night. I was speaking to our producer, Paul Fletcher. I said, this might turn into a bit of an exhibition game. Uruguay expected to go out of this World Cup. New Zealand, after that big whopping win, always... Oh, oh, I think he's going to be out. Yeah, he's in touch. His left, uh, his left boot is on the line before he goes out. Great cover and tackle there. There was another absolute whooping hit from Cody Taylor covering back. All Blacks making some uncharacteristic mistakes. Superb run from uh, Gaston Mieres. He didn't quite know where he was going after a potential knock-on. Wrong-footed uh, the All Blacks and got round the outside. Then it was great hands to get to the outside. Unfortunately, not to finish it off. It's really interesting, actually, because when Gaston Mieres fumbled the ball, it meant that the All Blacks' uh, defensive line gained a couple of metres. And in the process of gaining a couple of metres, they made space on the outside channel for them to go around them. And also just psychologically just waiting for the referee to blow his whistle there because it looked like a knock-on play on said Wayne Barnes well uh, from the restart New Zealand have kicked it towards this near side we've got a Uruguayan line out just outside of the All Blacks 22 entertaining game this it's still nil-nil New Zealand nil Uruguay nil 13 minutes on the clock 
And uh, anyone who's expecting a big scoreline to be racked up, well, it's not happening just yet as the ball is hacked down the field by New Zealand. Uh, they do eventually find touch. They're just slowly pushing Uruguay further and further back inside of their own half. That one kicked on there by Will Jordan. Crusaders winger. In, in at first receiver um, in his defensive uses of the Uruguayan line-out. So when it was nicked by New Zealand... Jordan got the ball, not normally a man who would be there for the exit kick. He's done a pretty good job taking it just over halfway. OK, so German Kessler for Uruguay waits to get the ball in. Disrupted by New Zealand, but still Uruguayan ball. Arata manages to get the ball away. The high bomb is put up into the air by Uruguay. A number of uh, players underneath it, but it's Damian McKenzie who comes up with the goods. Is there any good full back will tell you. And New Zealand back on the ball on the halfway line. Crossfield kick this time by McKenzie. He's looking for 50-22, but he's not got enough pace on that one. Hacked over the top. Oh, that's gorgeous there by Uruguay. Not quite taken in the end by their fly half, Echeverri. Yeah, the kind of bit of skill that, you know, any schoolboy or schoolgirl, when they're out practicing, hopes will come off one day on the biggest stage of them all as New Zealand win a penalty. And uh, we can now hear our referee, Wayne Barnes. No, if there's any big decisions to be made, we will bring him into the mix. Right Thank then, you. so it's going to be New Zealand's clear down on this right-hand wing down towards in the Uruguay. I'll keep trying to play these advances. It's Cam, OK, they seem to be paying off. There you go, Wayne Barnes. First intervention, just reminding Cam Roygaard that he's going to play advantage. Give the All Blacks an opportunity to play after a, Uru a Uruguayan mistake <laughs> and vice you versa, tried. which is why the game is nice and open. Uruguay are doing so well at the moment. They will... Tire. Um, it's only a case of when, not if, but at the moment, they're holding the All Blacks at arm's length. Five sports extra, New Zealand nil, Uruguay nil, as New Zealand go for the long line out over the top, taken cleanly, but they're still outside of the Uruguayan 22 no, no, for no. now. Don't no. forget, of course, if you're enjoying everything at World Thank Cup, you. there will be a Rugby Union Daily fresh, shiny and new in your inboxes tomorrow morning. It's going to be all about that Scotland-Ireland match, which looms large over this weekend. What is going to happen in Paul B as will they thunder away the All Blacks down this near side right wing? They're just slowing things down slightly here, the All Blacks. I think they've realised they're in a bit of an arm wrestle here and they don't like it as the ball comes away in the end. Uh, it's going to be the captain who works his way forward in the form of Sam Kane. New Zealand ball, six phases worked through and Uruguay now defending close to their own try line. Four metres left for the All Blacks to travel. Taken forward by Vai, the big second row. Spun out ball, lovely looping work here. McKenzie straight to the line. There's not going to be a problem with that one. Damian McKenzie does finally get the first try of this match, but Wayne Barnes is going to go and check something again. Is anyone going to score a try in this? Is anything going to be given? Let's turn up Wayne Barnes. Here's your first angle, Bonzi. I think he's saying it is a try. So nine blue. Yeah, we've got ten. Walking pizza. Yeah. And then ten. And then there's a near grab and he follows through. Ah. Uh, Richie Bawanga might be in a bit of trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. No try. No try. No try. Neck roll. Richie Mawanga. On the Uruguayan scrum half, Artat Arata, who, who actually, after Luke Jacobson had made half a bust and got an offload away, I think it was Sam Kane went to ground. Arata got right over the ball really, really quickly and bravely and was cleared out. I didn't see it first look that it was Moonga, two of the smallest blokes on the field, to be honest, in the middle of that breakdown. Arata's technique was really good, which meant that Moonga's had to be brilliant to move him, and it wasn't. 16 minutes played, New Zealand nil, Uruguay nil, seven turnovers conceded by New Zealand. Seven turnovers in 16 minutes, that's not good. No, messy, which is exactly why they went to that formation from their line-out. They didn't contest the, their own line-out, they threw it over the top, got onto the front foot, had four or five phases down the narrow side to really draw Uruguay tight and then put McKenzie into space on the outside. Oh, in Uruguay, they've just managed to win their own line after a bit of a tussle. They are having fun out there at the moment, Uruguay, and they are showing what they can do. Ranked 17th in the world at the moment, so 13 places below New Zealand in fourth, but we're now playing advantage to New Zealand if they've managed to steal the ball themselves on the floor. Moanga now 
he manages to get the ball away. Can you believe it? No score yet. We thought we've seen three tries. Every single one has been chalked off. As a big walloping run comes in there by Frizzell. He manages to make about 10 metres all on his own. Such sheer determination. Spun out ball to McKenzie. There's space out there, but Uruguay are doing well with their defensive work just to slow down and close the space for the All Blacks. Roy Gard once again. He's had one chalked off. He can see the line. A little bit of chalk fever for him, but he's going to come back. Advantage now to New Zealand right in front of the posts. Referee Wayne Barnes has blown his whistle. And a big decision here for New Zealand. 17 minutes played, no score on the clock, right in front of the posts. Surely they're not going to kick a goal. Yeah. Of fun. course, must be a scrum. Just putting one or two phases together now, again from a turnover on the halfway line. New Zealand worked it to the right. Richie Moonga dropped Tupu Vai back on the inside. Shannon Frizzell came on a uh, thundering line, as you said, Sarah. And then they went. Mackenzie held on to the ball. He should have moved it. It was either go wide early or have another phase, create another breakdown, and then get a walk in left. Some of that decision making from Damian Mackenzie touching on whether he plays 10 or 15. He's got the luxury of pace, so at provincial level he can make mistakes with decision making and run himself out of trouble. More difficult at international level, which he hasn't, which is why he hasn't quite made the number 10 shirt stick. Possession in this match so far has been 50-50 between these two sides. Uruguay in the mix here with 18 and a half minutes on the clock. They've enjoyed plenty of ball. They've managed to move it really well. They were saying in the build-up to this that this was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for much of these players. They said the whole of Uruguay would be watching this. So I believe it's a mid-morning at the moment in Uruguay. I think it might be a bit later than that. I didn't get the exact time. I know it's 8 a.m. in the morning in New Zealand. I didn't write down the Uruguayan time. I'm just trying to do my South American maths backwards. What do you reckon? It's six hours behind? Seven? But it doesn't matter where you are, there's 19 minutes gone and it's nil-nil. <laughs> there you go. Thanks very much. Oh, well, there you go. It's 4.25 in the afternoon, so I was completely off. There you go. But uh, what a time to be a Uruguayan rugby fan. And uh, as I said, the competition that they play in at the moment, Super Rugby Americas, they've uh, got teams now from Argentina. They've got teams from uh, Paraguay, Chile, Argentina, and uh, also one from America as well as they managed to break away from this scrum. There's still Uruguayan numbers here. Mackenzie just uses brute force to work his way through. Straight off the back of the scrum, they spat it out. Mackenzie goes over, and I think we have our first try at the fourth time of asking. 19 minutes played, New Zealand 5, Uruguay 0. Quick check all round, so vulnerable from a midfield scrum right under your post. Mackenzie and Moonga post themselves behind the scrum. Scrum half breaks to the right. Geordie Barrett runs short, passes behind. Roygaard passes behind him. Terribly run line by um, Barrett, to be fair, much too early, but he didn't need too much mystery because Uruguay just tightened a fraction. Little show and go from McKenzie and got the strength to get over and legitimately get the ball down. No mistakes. So hard to defend from there. Damian McKenzie, of course, he's... Uh playing at fullback, traditionally seeing more at fly half. It's interesting, why is it when we always talk about New Zealand positions and players moving around, nobody really seems to bat an eyelid, but when it comes to, when you talk about England with Ford and Farrell and Smith, it's a problem. Let's not pretend that Moonga versus Barrett hasn't been a running narrative for New Zealand. They've, they've for so long gone for the either or because they've got so much quality in their back three. As Moonga goes for goal, Low, low driving kick and it goes through they ended up having both in the team by moving Barrett back to fullback um, so they've had their debate in a different way to us we do get a little bit fixated but they're, the, they're, not, the, they're not the only positions but they are massive calls when you've got players of equal ability do you get all your best players on the pitch somehow or which is where England have found themselves over the years with the Ford Farrell debate. Well, it's New Zealand 7, Uruguay 0, 21 minutes on the clock. So we just wait for Uruguay to restart. Just on that, Paul, um, we talked there about moving the, the second playmaker essentially into the 15 shirt. If you go back to sort of 2015, 2007, that sort of period, it was more traditional that you saw the second playmaker maybe more as the 12. Uh, what, what do you feel more is the fashion now or the style of play when it comes to where you put a second playmaker out there? Yeah, well, I mean, the 
Kiwis have literally called them the first 5-8 and the second 5-8, the first playmaker and your second playmaker at 10 and 12. And you look at the development of someone like Mar Nonu, who just an absolute specimen of a player, but grafted on all those soft skills and decision-making stuff over the years. So they, they forced him to do it. But with the way defences are set up, the way attacks have gone to um, kind of more of a rugby league shape over the years, that the entry and decision-making from a fullback has become more and more important as a second outlet and decision maker which is why we've seen the general change in most teams across the world voice there of Paul Grayson 2003 World Cup winner here with us on Sports Extra as we keep a close eye on this Paul A fixture the last match in the full stage for New Zealand and Uruguay New Zealand playing for a place in the quarterfinals they need to win with a bonus point to guarantee it and they've got their work cut out for them here it's New Zealand 7 Uruguay 0 and uh, Uruguay just knock on at the worst of moments. Felipe Echeverri has just knocked on five metres from his own line and uh, wants to go and hide in a hole as he looks in his own face on the big screen. That's another one of those where, where New Zealand have gone on the counter-attack. Damian McKenzie's poked it forward, left-footed. Um, Rodrigo Silva, the Uruguayan fullback, has fielded the ball. He's got plenty of time to clear it if he wants. He's had a little think for a second or two and then launched it inside for his 10 under his own post. About shin height. So he's robbed him of the time to get the ball away and then chucked him a shocker of a pass. It still should have been taken by the Uruguayan 10, but Silva's decision-making there under a little bit of pressure, quite sketchy. Well, this position where the All Blacks have their scrum, it's pretty much exactly the same as where they had the last scrum where they actually got the try. And they have set up slightly differently on this occasion. They've loaded the short channel out on the left-hand side and they've just left Barrett and Jordan on the right although I have to say it looks like Mwanga and McKenzie they look like they're ready to go in full flight round on this right wing where the space is and that's exactly what's about to happen as Rory Gard looks up here they come they're spinning round here you go they've managed to flood the channel and Mwanga goes straight over too easy try number two then for the All Blacks it is now New Zealand 12 Uruguay now exactly the same setup as before there's about 10 different combinations you can run off those scrums. This time they choose to pass from the base straight to a charging Geordie Barrett, who checks the defenders, gives a circle ball, a little inside loop to Mwunga running outside him with McKenzie overtaking him. Will Jordan on the right-hand side. Mwunga so quick, so quick. Shows the ball once, twice. Then he knows he's in the gap, using everyone around him to create the space and his own little pair of jet shoes to get through it. Nice finish. What could Uruguay have done there just to defend that better than they did? Or well, outright gamble and just <laughs> just blitz on the first three. Yeah. And and bank on Geordie Barrett maybe not being able to get the ball quite so easily to um, Moonga. But if you get it half wrong, they go over the top and you're, you're dead in the water anyway. So really, really, really difficult. Good technical attack. A better team than Uruguay or a better backline than Uruguay would still struggle. Um to get man-on-man -man coverage there. Now, I think there is somebody running around the pitch that should not be. Uh, who's out on the far side. Oh, no, it's a ball boy. <laughs> it's come from one side to the other. It's just a very big ball boy. Um, he's got to crouch down. It is Mwanga now who uh, sends the ball through. So it's now 14-0. And the Mexican wave starts going around the stadium as well. Now, a lot of people don't like Mexican waves, which I fully understand, but they seem to have been a very early feature of this tournament, uh, no matter what the scoreline, wherever you are. Well, for, in my experience, they do them in France when they're excited and having a good time. We, we do them at Twickenham when bored. everyone's bored and nothing's happening. <laughs> Well, I think they're a bit excited. We have had one round of La Marseille so far as uh, the Mexican wave continues its way around the OL Stadium. Of course, this is the home of Olympic Lyonnais. It's nice to football, but uh, very happy to host rugby. And it'll be here tonight where Paul and I will both be back again for the second and final match this weekend in Paul A, when, of course, France will be taking on Italy. That one also an 8 o'clock start. That one will be on 5 Live. 26 minutes on the clock, New Zealand 14, Uruguay nil from the restart. New Zealand have the ball, they're inside of their own half between the 10 and the 22, 15 metres out from the far side. Roy Gard with the box kick, high into the sky, not made a lot of metres, but New Zealand have gathered, but offside. Uh, I think they've been caught out there by the 10 metre rule because he didn't get enough length on that kick. Yeah, poor kick from the left-footed Roy Gard, straight up and down, forwards didn't have a chance to drop back or get out of the 10 metre circle, so... Any, any one of five or six to pick from to the referee as Uruguay go for the corner. 
big moment here for Uruguay. What an opportunity. This is the one of the best platforms they've had so far in this fixture. They did have a line out a little bit earlier. It wasn't quite as close to the line, but now they're five metres out. The problem they have at the moment is they've got a player down injured uh, out on the far side. Now, this isn't a scrum, so Wayne Barnes doesn't really have any interest in hanging around and waiting. It is a wing, though, as he quickly rushes back to his feet in the form of uh, Freitas. Oh, no, it's not. It's Mieres who's managed to get back to his feet. So Mieres back in the mix. Here we go. Uruguay, big moment for them. You suspect that Mieres might be part of this move. They were desperate to get him back. <laughs> Close eye on. Ball comes in from Kessler. Taken in the air there by Lindekar. And uh, Uruguay have done pretty well with their line out so far this World Cup. It's crabbing slightly to the side. Let's listen in to Wayne Barnes in case he says to use it. Stay bad. Stay bad. So yes, there please. we go. They are saying it's got to be executed now. We managed to spin it out towards the back. It's Villaseca, the captain, who has to go forward. They've lost another couple of metres, but it's a penalty. It's for Uruguay. You're fine, man wrong side. So there you go, offside there from New Zealand. And another opportunity for Uruguay. Much closer to the post, this one. Ball's right. They're just having a little discussion. Yes, Echeverry goes back to the touchline. The crowd like it. If you do hear any enthusiastic French speaking, it's because there is a uh, French radio station who are next to us here at uh, the AOL Stadium. A lot of excitement is still going on. But right then, here we go. Uruguay, another line out, another opportunity. What can they do this time? Ball comes in. Goes a little bit shorter towards the front on this occasion to Arbello, but it's gone back out of play on the far side. The ball almost spat out okay. then. Just to check whose ball it is, Maris. Yeah, yeah, we're just checking, we're just checking. Just one yeah, second, please. More. It's going to be black line out unless we see anything different. Oh, so it's did two. That catch First black one, hand. it's a knock on by black. It did, and then it's a knock but then on I think blue. it was two knocked on by Villaseca. First by black, then by blue. Scrum. So the scrum is going to be Uruguayan scum. So it just hits the arm of black in the pass. There and we then go. hits the arm of blue into touch. So Uruguay get the scrum. Good big touch, good big touch. And a big moment still for them. Just to be camped out five metres, maybe six or seven at the moment. Not down, not down. From the All Blacks line. Okay. We haven't seen a scrum in ages. So you've got Sangrinetti, Kessler and Arbello for Uruguay going up against okay. Tantafasi, Taylor and Lomax. For the All Blacks, although having said that, it's not Lomax because he had to go off. So Fletcher Newell has been thrown in there. Control on set. Crouch. Big moment. Five. Santiago Arata has the ball. The 27-year-old can't get in on this occasion because that's one that's gone straight down to the ground. Okay, okay. All, all we need to do, just, I understand that this isn't great either. Get our feet underneath, fight with that left side. That left side. Tell us all about the left side of the scrum, Paul Grayson. What's the problem? Yeah, I, I, I once the Uruguayan Lou said to fight harder. On the left-hand side of the scrum. I don't know whether that's coaching or not. Just make a decision, Wayne, please. Let's get on with it. Well, this one I'll be watching very closely by the All Black scrum coach, Greg Feek. He uh, did say that the intensity in All Blacks training this week has uh, really gone up a few notches. He said he know, all the players know that they're competing for spots at the moment. Trying not to get complacent about the position that they're in. Obviously, a couple of big thumping wins that they've had in the pool off the back of that opening loss to France as the ball spilt on the floor there by Uruguay and it's been knocked on in the process. And the All Blacks have the first knock on. So it's still going to be Uruguayan scrum, but they're now 10 metres out. It was a good scrum from Uruguay and a quick heel. And then Manuel Diana flicked the ball away. I think it was Vila Seca. Both centres on the charge, just getting there too early. Don't give the number eight a gap to pass the ball into. Knock it on themselves. And after another lecture, we'll have a scrum. And expect New Zealand to thump it down the pitch and then get on their toes after it. 31 minutes on the clock, New Zealand 14, Uruguay nil. Just a reminder that, of course, what's been going on in the world of sport today at the Cricket World Cup, which has just got underway, England, well, they lost to New Zealand in their first match of the World Cup. It was a rematch, of course, of the final of four years ago uh, that saw the all the Black about say the All Blacks, the Black Caps, uh, take victory by nine wickets. Don't forget to look at the TMS podcast for that one. 
crowd. With all that noise, there's Wayne Barnes has found the knock on by New Zealand. Must have been as uh, Diana passed the ball away. So it's uh, a Uruguayan scrum. Ball comes away then, unable to be taken again by New Zealand. It's sorry by Uruguay, so it ends up being hacked away. It's going to go out of play on the far side, and it's going to be a Uruguayan scrum. And you just feel that every time they get the ball back, they've just lost 10 meters every single time. So they're still attacking. They're still inside of the New Zealand half, but uh, looking a little bit less deadly on every occasion. Yeah, they ran exactly the same move this time. They got their timing right. Villaseca just forgot to catch the ball. It happens. Um, worth saying that Andres Villaseca he's actually the brother of the former Uruguayan captain uh, Santiago Villaseca as the ball goes over the top stolen though by New Zealand and uh, it was actually Santiago Villaseca who uh, spoke to the Uruguayan press earlier this week saying apparently their mum can't sleep or eat in the 24 hours before a test match when either of them have been playing he since hung up the boots a while ago oh Damien McKenzie steals the ball back inside this is great stuff from the All Blacks too easy for them though as Will Jordan is now going to dot it down between the posts that is their third try and that is the Uruguayans absolutely falling asleep at the wheel it's now New Zealand 19 Uruguay nil turnover once again from the All Blacks Geordie Barrett just hesitated with the ball then threw out a beautiful miss pass it's Damien McKenzie two on two so he put it on the toe and the ball was going to bounce out for a 50-22 McKenzie absolutely full tilt picked the ball from in touch one handed didn't transfer it back into two hands before he went into touch let's hope he didn't touch the ground here no he didn't one handed one handed finger roll no. inside pass right Mwango quickly took the um, he very quickly took the conversion I thought Wayne Barnes was going to check it, but I think he's just said it's absolutely OK. And we're now getting a lot of replays of where exactly Damian McKenzie's foot was. But it, it, I think they're saying, look, it's a blade of grass he's in. It's one of the best bits of skill you will ever see at full tilt. Damian McKenzie, that is just absolutely incredible. The dexterity to field that ball flat out one-handed and without missing a beat. Pass it back on the inside with just dexterity beyond belief. Amazing try. New Zealand 21, Uruguay now three tries then for New Zealand. Are they going to wrap up a bonus point before half time? They've got five minutes left to try and do it after what was such a bright spell for Uruguay early on in this match. We actually had three tries chalked off before we actually got one. Two of them were New Zealand tries, one was for the Uruguayans. But, uh, they've not been able to really fire a shot since. They've had opportunities, but they've got a penalty now inside of the All Blacks half. I fully expect them to try and drop this down into the corner for a line out. Uh, I have to say, discipline from the All Blacks hasn't been good. Well, they've, they've turned over the ball a few times that time. Just flat out good work in the breakdown from Lucas Bianchi as they go for the corner and miss. Absolute muck up there by Uruguay. So when you get your penalty, you've got to get it out in the field of play, and that's gone into the try area and just sort of died. So um, what, what? it's going to come all the way back from where it was kicked, and uh, you just get, get a black scrum yeah. as a result. And they just play on the big screen okay. once again. The skill, the wonder that was Damian McKenzie with that tap back inside to Jordan. That is gets better every time well where, wherever you wherever you get your highlights go find it because that is just unbelievable even the point of will jordan cutting back on the inside because he wants to give him half a chance he is just magnificent classy bit of stuff something for the 28 year old to really hang his hat on of course Bowden barrett is on the bench for new zealand in this fixture as much as the Keep All Blacks have tried not to say it, they will be thinking about who's going to be playing in that quarter-final, what numbers they will be having on their backs as Moanga comes now on the halfway line. Kane, the captain involved, 10 metres inside of Uruguayan territory. Still the black shirts flood forwards. As a real low ball is taken round the ankles there by Jordan, who hacks it on her as a result. It wasn't easy. Really well taken, though, by Arata, who goes back. Did he take it inside of his own try area though yes so it's going to come back five meters and it's going to be an all black scrum your, your number one must stay in the contest all He's blacks playing so flat to the line really this time a poor pass from 
Geordie Barrett went for the miss right to his winger, threw it on the floor. Another delightful bit of skill. Will Jordan scoops it up on the on the half volley, one-handed. He gathers it in and puts the chip kick. So they're just starting to purr the All Blacks. Right, Wayne Barnes is uh, just having a little bit of a word there with Sam Kane, who is not happy about something. Yeah. Of course I can, of course, of course. Well, the table as it stands at the moment in Paul A sees New Zealand at the top on 14 points. That doesn't guarantee them yet a place in the quarterfinals because they need the bonus point to be able to do that. So they're on three tries at the moment, 21 points to Uruguay's nil. 37 minutes on the clock, five metre scrum from the Uruguayan line. Is this the moment for the All Blacks to seal their place in the last eight? Never failed to do so, so Team far five. at a Rugby World Cup. As the ball is in, Roy Gard is out. It was spat out. He didn't read that well. Oh. Miscommunication. Roy Gard still going over. Gets the bonus point try, despite an absolute shambles at the back of the scrum between him and Jacobson. And Roy Gard goes over. Bonus point try scored. Barring Uruguay coming back and doing something exceptional to win this. The All Blacks are in the quarterfinals. Yeah, the scrum collapsed again as the ball came out New Zealand were going to play to the right the ball bounced Roygaard had to go back to get it Nicolas Freitas the left winger came in to tackle him Roygaard just put a right and then a left left Freitas on his knees grabbing for thin air that's a wonderful finish from the young nine well, he slides over all came after a bit of miscommunication between him and the Chiefs at number eight, Jacobson. A lot of people were surprised that uh, Jacobson got the nod at number eight, but I think they had to arrest Ardi Severa eventually. <laughs> it's been a bit of a shift so far at this World Cup. Right then. Here he comes, Moanga. He's immaculate with the boots so far this evening on 100%, three from three. This one about seven or eight metres from the near side touch. Needs to turn this one in slightly from the right. It's got height on it, but it does not have direction, so he misses that one. These three from four, it means New Zealand 26, Uruguay nil. And there is still time for a restart for Uruguay before they head in for half time. We've got to give Uruguay some credit getting past the 19 minute mark before they conceded anything to the All Blacks. It wasn't all, Black, all New Zealand sloppiness, Uruguay physical and adventurous. It's just now when they're tired, that last 10 minutes, the All Blacks are able to make the most of any mistakes. Restart then by Uruguay, not taken cleanly by New Zealand. It's all backwards, though, says Wayne step Barnes. Back, they have back. it just outside of their own 22. Roy Gard manages to deploy Whitelock. Whitelock going forward on the occasion of his 150th cap. Hardly expected to retire after this tournament after 34 years old. Ball comes back now to Mackenzie. He puts up the high ball, chased by Mwanga. Not going to be taken by a black shirt, this time taken forward by Echeverry again. The Argentinian 10 manages to deploy one of his wings in Freitas, but they lose ground whenever they try and move the ball around at the moment. Uruguay is a real problem for them in attack. They have made ground in this fixture. They've had a few breaks, which have been nice. But as a general rule, the defensive all-black line has dealt with Uruguay very well. The ball taken forward this time by Freitas once again, the left wing. Can also play in the centres when required. Uh, New Zealand shirts continue just to suck up the Uruguayan attack. They've made a couple of metres here, so they're over the gain line for the first time in a little while here, Uruguay. Diego Arbello. Again, plays a bit of rugby at Montevideo, but mainly known for his work with the Penarol. Nice little bit of work coming in by the backs, just trying to do something creative there through the captain, Villa Seca. And again, for all of these efforts, eight phases work through here as the clock is well into the red here. Uruguay are making sort of a centimetre at a time as the ball is eventually knocked on. And that will be the half. It is New Zealand 26, Uruguay nil. Highly expected that New Zealand have confirmed their place now into the quarterfinals. Uh, just a shame Ur Uruguay haven't been able to keep it up, Paul Bracey. No, difficult for them in the face of the imbalance that you're going to get with a Tier 1 team right at the top of the world. Just basic fitness. But still to the end there, Uruguay being able to put phases together against a strong New Zealand defence. Asking questions, not making many metres. But at least they got the wherewithal and the technical ability 
to keep going just before half time. New Zealand scoring off three first phase plays, uh, first phase plays, uh, three walk ins after Uruguay mistakes deep in their own half, and one absolute worldy piece of skill from Damian McKenzie to put in Will Jordan just before half time. So, big tick for Uruguay being able to stick in for 20 minutes. The All Blacks not at their best, but just starting to work through the gears. Thanks, Paul. Well, we're going to let you get a cup of tea. If uh, I don't think we've really seen any tea here in the stadiums yet. We'll try and get you something, maybe a sweetie or something like that. Thank but, you. Um, half-time, New Zealand 26, Uruguay nil. But as much as we're talking about New Zealand, we're going to just focus on their neighbours slightly uh, here at half-time in Lyon because, of course, Australia are facing an early exit from the World Cup this weekend. Legendary fly half Michael Liner has spoken to Matt Dawson on Rugby Union Daily, and it's all about the current state of Australian rugby and how he feels about their World Cup disappointment? Well I guess my overriding um, emotion is one of uh, sadness actually. Um, Australia really haven't sort of fired a shot at this World Cup and it's really disappointing. Um, I feel for the players, um, they're not bad players and they've worked really hard but come to when they get out in the field it just doesn't seem to click for them and uh, you know I feel the way that this has gone on at this World Cup that there's going to be a few of them that might struggle to you know get over this experience um, I hope not but that's my sort of overrider feeling is one of sadness for the players but also for you know a lot of Australian supporters not only the ones back at home around the world but also the ones that have you know financially and emotionally supported the the team in France and to be knocked out so early uh, which what it looks like at this stage um, is terribly disappointing for them all. Is it a matter of the way that Australia have been knocked out, the way that they've played? Because not everybody can go through to the quarterfinal. There may have been solace in the fact that Australia played brilliant rugby and got knocked out on points difference or something. But is it the manner of which they're playing at the moment that's most disappointing? Um, a little bit. And... You know, you've got to give credit to the opposition, Fiji. Of, you know, it's not not a not a fluke that Fiji are a good team. You know, be, beating England here at Twickenham before the tournament, and I, I I just see with Fiji the rise of Fiji is is not an accident. You know, you had the Fiji and Drua for the last two years have been playing as a team in the Super Rugby competition, so that gels a real base for the Fijian team. Then you sprinkle a bit of stardust, like Rodranda and those sort of people that play overseas, and you've got a pretty decent side. Um, Fiji's problem in the past was when they, you know, just came together a week before the tournament and away they went. This time they've had a team that's played together a lot. So that's no surprise there, so full credit to them. And also Wales have surprised a lot of people as well in the way they've played. They've come back with Gatland. You know, got rid of a few older players and, and you know, the young team seems to have jowled. So it's not the opposition's been good, but Australia have been disappointing. And to answer your question, yes, I think there is disappointment the way that Australia's played. Um, they haven't really fired a shot in any games. And even against Georgia, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes to go, it was still in the balance there. And Georgia had a lot of momentum. I was at the game. You could feel it in the crowd. They were all supporting Georgia, except the Australians. And... Uh, then Australia just there's a, there was a turning point about 25 minutes to go that turned it and then they ran away pretty easily. So I think the disappointment is that they really haven't fired a shot in this World Cup. They've gone out sort of with a sort of in, with a whimper. Uh, and there is, I think that's a fair comparison to England. But Australia, as far as I can remember, as a, being a fan to being a player to being a pundit, there was a certain DNA about. Australia and how they played. They didn't need to be the best side. They had the brains to work out how to beat any opposition, whether they were favourites or not. That was part of the Australian DNA, and I, d I haven't seen any of that. No, you're right, and that was the way, you know, going right back to when I first started. We didn't have a, a great forward pack, but we used to, you know, if we got 50% of the possession and territory, we'd probably win the game because we just seemed to be a little bit more athletic, a little bit smarter the way we used the ball, all that sort of thing. And uh, you're right, it just didn't seem to exist this time round. But I think it's it's probably the culmination of a, of a downward sort of trend over the last 10 or 15 years. And rugby's been heading sort of this way, I think. And this was a real, you know, 
really sort of full stop wake up call, you know, that rugby, this has to be done something in Australia about this and the decline of rugby in terms of, you know, people attending games in Australia, the the youngsters coming through are choosing different sports um, which are better funded than rugby, etc. So I think there's a there's a real sort of issue behind all this as well. And we, we all sort of hope that you know, a successful Australian rugby team can carry us through and plaster over these problems, but I'm afraid this time it hasn't. And it's time for people to sort of full stop, let's see what we can do and go forward. For the, dare I say, the global sake of the game, mm. there are some massive rugby events coming to Australia. Yeah. You know, Lions, yep. World Cup. As, as much as it's difficult to beat around the bush here, you, 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 you feel that something significant need, needs to change because of the Lions and a World Cup coming to Australia. Very important because it's, that's a, <laughs> it's very important for Australia that they're competitive as well because not only from a global point of view, but from an Australian point of view, if you're not filling out stadiums for a Lions tour and there's not commercial interests and TV and all that sort of thing, um, <laughs> real trouble, mm. real trouble for Australian rugby, but also the globe. You're exactly right. And a World Cup coming up, you know, if Australia's got to qualify for that, my God, you know. I don't think that's going to be the case, but we want to be competitive. We want to have the local sort of support behind us, um, the whole country behind us, as opposed to, you know, AFL and um, rugby league supporters sort of laughing at us and putting us down, which is what is happening at the moment. Is there a worry <laughs> around where Australian rugby could be? Has been for a while. Yeah. Really? Yeah. And I don't really want to, you know, because it, it's sort of a, it's at a pretty much a low point at the moment, but I think a lot of people, have, and, and me in particular, have seen it coming for a while and have been worried about it for a while. There's talent there um, at schoolboy level and that sort of... And that used to be... So go back a little bit. And I'm not a big one for going back in my day we did this, but the traditional pathway of an Australian rugby player was school. Talent was identified at school because there weren't that many schools that were playing, so you could identify talent. It was nurtured very, very well from that sort of 15-year age group right the way through to under-18 schoolboys, under-21s, now under-20s, and it was looked after. And then you'd go to a club, your state, and then Australian rugby. We seem to have lost that ability to connect juniors with clubs and state, and juniors seem to disappear. They either go to league or lose interest in union and go and do other things, or Aussie rules as well now in football. So there seems to be a disconnect. And until we reconnect that and try and um, get that pathway reconnected, I think we'll still struggle to have people coming through. And there's a lot of, you know, youngsters like to see, you know, get heroes and success. And at the moment, a lot of those people are in different sports. They're not in rugby at the moment. And... and sort of like trying to bring that mm. into the 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 relevance of the glory years you feel that you know going back into those late 80s and 90s where australia were absolutely flying high mm. with their rugby union that was a significant reason why because of the the great club culture and the state rugby that was going on to produce that Yes, and it was the, the the majority of the Australian team was from New South Wales and Queensland, from Sydney and Brisbane, basically, and the club competitions there, club school first and then into clubs, and a lot of those players in that sort of eighty four, ninety one, ninety nine era would play their rugby together in Queensland and New South Wales, but with a sprinkling of ACT people um, as well, and I just feel that that create a bit like Leinster you know they play together a lot they know one another really well and know what they're going to do so there's that sort of they gel together um, and we've seems to have lost that a little bit now I think with having five teams in super rugby and competing against New Zealand and South Africa it's, it's tough you know and we're not winning a lot against those teams when South Africa were in the competition but having five teams has really dissipated the 
that playing togetherness. We sort of put you know, players all over the place and we just don't have the playing population to, to fill these teams. So how, may, how maybe there's going to be some tough decisions having to come, come up, coming up as to how we structure um, the whole sort of situation in Australia. And I'm afraid that the results at this World Cup have shown that the current system's not working. It hasn't been working for a while and it's going to take some time for any changes to come to fruition, but it, something has to happen. We can't continue this downward sort of spiral. And those, those changes, they've got to be innovative and mm. uh, you know, bold bold I think is the one in it. We can, look at, we can look at the Irish system, the New Zealand system where there's a lot of centrally contracted players and it's all about you know, going towards the point of the pyramid and you know, ultimately it's Ireland that all the you know, provinces and the schoolboy stuff is sort of aimed at. Same with New Zealand. Whereas Australia at the moment we're a federated system where you've got you know, states that have their own little fiefdom and no, they don't like each other, and they don't like the R, don't trust the R, uh, Rugby Australia, and so there's got to be a change in how we're doing those things at the moment. And all the things I've talked about are big, bold decisions that will not be popular. Um, but if we don't, there's a real problem um, in going the same way we're going. And also, you know, the other thing is that you need money to do this, and money's an issue. And with the performance that we've had at the current World Cup with another um, television contract to be negotiated soon, the values are dropping. Mm. So it's sort of a downward spiral. You know, you're looking at Aussie rules and rugby league in Australia, they're billion, billion dollar contracts, TV contracts. Ours is 30 million or something. So that's sort of the difference. That's what we're competing with in Australia. So Aussie rules and rugby league can afford to go into all the schools rugby union traditional schools and actually find the best talent and take it because you know that's what kids want to you know they they look at their rugby league stars and they you know they can go and give contracts to these kids straight out of school and it's uh, it's a big issue it's a big problem and i don't know um I, there's hopefully smarter people than me that are involved in making decisions going forward but they're not going to be popular but unless we do them it's um it's going to be, you know, there's a real possibility of Australian rugby really disappearing down a, a big sinkhole. Service! On BBC iPlayer. Have you seen my sugar? Yeah, it's over here, girl. <laughs> oh, you're definitely not sweet no. enough. No chance. A brand new drama starring Vanette Robinson and Stephen Graham. This is impossible. I need help, please. Don't worry, I've got it. No, no, no! <laughs> It's like working with a bunch of school kids. Oh, no, I'm not going to calm down. I've had enough. What happened last time you lost your temper in the kitchen? He's all used to work for me. If it wasn't for here, I'd still have my own restaurant. Boiling Point. Watch on BBC iPlayer. Well, welcome back to Five Sports Extra. We are live in Lyon for the final pool stages of this Rugby World Cup. We're watching New Zealand take on Uruguay. And what a performance from New Zealand eventually that came. Halftime score, New Zealand 26, Uruguay nil. Uh, before we get the second half back underway, just worth mentioning that chat between Matt Dawson and Michael Liner is available, of course, on your Rugby Union daily podcast. You can download that from BBC Sounds. you just got about 10 minutes there, but their chat goes on for a good 40 minutes or so. Of course, don't forget that Australia, they're building towards what they're describing as a golden decade in Australia. They've got the Men's Rugby World Cup, the Women's Rugby World Cup, they've got the Lions Tour. There's a huge amount of rugby union on the biggest stages of all that's heading their way and a lot of problems to sort out. Um, alongside me listening to all of that was uh, former England fly half Paul Grayson. Uh, ultimately, rugby union wants a strong Australia. Needs a strong Australia. Um, and it's listening to that in, in it's a sadness about Michael Liner, and we all feel it. But in the in the search for development and expansion, sometimes you dilute the product so much that it loses its flavour. Well, if you want to hear more of that debate, do head to BBC Sounds. And of course, there will be another Rugby Union Daily in your inboxes tomorrow morning. I'll give you those details in a few moments' time, but we're about to get back underway. It is New Zealand who are travelling from right to left in this second half. It's Damien McKenzie who gets us underway. 
And Uruguay wearing their pale blue shirts and white shorts who gather inside of their own half between the 10 and the 22. We're saying that Uruguay, they've managed to score a couple of tries in every single game so far at this World Cup. So the fact they've got nothing on the board is a little bit disappointing by their own standards. As the ball flies, flies high into the sky there and gathered in the end by McKenzie inside of all black territory and I have to say Mackenzie's been a real live wire this evening he's got a bit of a bit between his teeth maybe a point to prove about his position in this all black squad a wonderful bit of skilled rules deployed by him in the advantage. first half where he tiptoed down this uh, near side advantage. touch to back the ball back inside for a Will Jordan try as the ball comes crossfield kick now to Barrett popped out of his hands there by Barrett but they'll come back for an all black penalty in the middle of the field and they'll look to clear their lines from the halfway yeah, just going back to what you were saying about Uruguay having scored a couple of tries in every game. They had, what, three attacking lineouts on the five-metre line. They had two attacking scrums. All of them ended up in a, an unforced error. They missed touch from 35 metres out going for the corner. That could have been another attempt to get on the scoreboard. The All Blacks aren't going to give you all that many. So if they're going to get that two tries or better, next time they get an opportunity like that, they need to take it. Geordie Barrett sends the ball down towards the far side. He's got that one bang in the middle of the 22. So still about 15 metres for New Zealand to travel. They've got four tries on the board. Mackenzie, Moanga, Jordan and Roy Gard all on the team score sheet so far. No changes to either side at half time. I'll run you through the team sheets when we get a pause in play shortly. But it's New Zealand who are currently trying to attack. Warning there from Wayne Barnes for New Zealand to try and move the ball. Roy Gard does eventually get it out, looks up, finds Barrett. He decides to take it into contact himself and not use Anton Leonard Brown, who is just hanging on his shoulder. And Uruguay have done well to really slow that down. They're still powering through. Wonderful ruck work by Uruguay. I've stolen the ball as well. And it's been knocked on in the end by the All Blacks. And Uruguay have it. And Uruguay at the breakdown can be a thing of beauty. It really can be. They've just got to do something with the ball and they get it. And here they go. They're inside of the 22. They're just a little dink over the head. Bounce of the ball. Mwanga had to watch it go over the top. Now, interesting. Nice. Wonderful, wonderful work there by the Uruguayan wing. I was worried that the touch judge was going to give it the wrong way, but what he did, Gaston Mieres, was he batted it back inside so it hit uh, Mwanga, and it's a Uruguayan liner. Great work in the breakdown. Didn't quite see who won the turnover. The Yankee, perhaps. Or Adeo. But they went for the crossfield kick out of the 22. A la the All Blacks. Mieres, lovely bit of skill to flip it back. Oh, German Kessler can't find his man in the lineup. Bounces over the head. All Blacks get it back. Such is the story of Uruguay. They tend to get something and then they lose it straight away. And here come the All Blacks on the counter. Mwanga looks up. Barrett is there. Sam Kane's hanging out in the back line as well. Pushes it towards that 22-metre line. All about black ball for the time being. Pushing out towards that far side wing. All Blacks a little bit east to west at the moment, but it's still theirs. And there's a little bit of north in that trajectory as well. That's all they need to keep this one trucking up. Roy Gard, this is advantage. slow ball advantage. There you go. Penalty is conceded by the Uruguayans as Roy Gard tries to snipe round. And uh, the warning against the Uruguayan player for lying on the floor. Cam Roy Gard really impresses me. His service is razor sharp. Bullet passes from the base of the rook whenever he can he has that ability of course if you grow up watching Aaron Smith and you mimic him you're going to have a great set of all-round skills he's just got that natural calmness over the ball then he can fire it away flat to give Moenga and Co plenty of time to make their decisions real prospect Taylor gets the ball in manages to find Whitelock who's put up Uruguay managed to push them all a couple of metres back it's been spat out by New Zealand they're not interested in mauling that now so Barrett pushes forward Tries to use a little bit of muscle to get a couple of metres out of the turf. This time it was the one change as it's Fletcher Newell on the field after it was an early exit in the end for Tyrell Lomax. Still the All Blacks work round the corner. They're looking strong here, five metres out from the line. Not going to be on that occasion there by Fanaranuku. He still needs a bit of support to arrive. And it's going to be pushed forward. It is the All Blacks who go over. It's the substitute tight head and Fletcher Newell who eventually goes over. And that's try number five, New Zealand 31, Uruguay nil. Much more directness about that attack from New Zealand. Using their heavy runners, Geordie Barrett's looked a little bit clunky at 12 tonight with some of his distribution, but when he gets his head down and charges, six foot five is a handful to stop. And they get the two wingers in, in tandem. 
Will Jordan Fanger Nuku drives for the line as Uruguay recover they just can't cope with the next big well timed run just talk to him mate he's starting to from the All Blacks Andres forwards it's ruthless that edge to it now it's almost like they've come out half time and said ok they've had their fun here we go well the voice there of Paul Grayson 2003 Rugby World Cup winner here with us on 5 Sports Extra as we wait for Moanga to line up this conversion he's 4 3 from 4 with the boots so far this is kick number 5 as he uh, takes his time he's not in a rush he's very keen for his teammates to have a little bit of a break as he just sucks a little bit of oxygen in. The shot clock just working its way down. Still 18 seconds left to go. And I don't think he's in too much of a rush. As he eventually lines up his kick. And that one's come off the post. So uh, Richie Moranga maybe should actually just speed things up. He's now three from five with the boot. And uh, at the kind of when the statistics you start worrying a little bit about a kicker when you, you're starting to miss that kind of number. I know there's other options at kicking here, but this is a big discussion, particularly around what we've seen with the spring box with Pollard coming back. Yeah, and also there's context. Four or five misses in a game like this from Mwunga when his mind's maybe not absolutely 100% on the job is uh, just a lack of application technically I back him in the big moments as a goal kicker though Mwunga he's uh, he is a class player normally class off the tee well, change for Uruguay Man Juan, Juan Manuel Rodriguez is on the field Ignacio Dotti is off from there's uh, changes also for New from Zealand that. as well onto the field is Tamati Williams oh, as oh, offer yeah, Tanga Fassi yeah. has made his way off and it'll be interesting when Ethan De Groot is back from his ban if Tanga Fassi has done enough he had one little duff moment in the first half but uh, as you rightly called Paul Grayson wasn't it entirely his fault no we don't you don't always make mistakes okay. on purpose. There is very often somebody helping you do it. Okay, so uh, beautiful moment if you like a scrum and you like it to look pretty because this is bang on the halfway line in the middle of the field and it is an all blacks scrum. Options far and wide as all the players are fanned out in both directions as Roy Gard waits to get the ball in. Stay high. Warning high. there from Stay referee high. Wayne Barnes as the shove comes on there by New Zealand, who almost fell there, but they managed to pick themselves up. They're going to flood down the right hand side. Mackenzie, wonderful footwork. Oh, there's such good running, and he's got support on him as well. Out towards Jordan on the far side. Roy Gard there as well as they eventually rise. Quick distribution from Roy Gard. Fantastic to Frizzell. Down on the floor, Penalty five meters to travel. This is really quick ball from the All Blacks. Taken now, you can see on the field as well. It's at Samasoni. Tangiaho, who's also onto the field. Big pass out wide from Jordan, manages to find his opposite wing. Really great work. In the corner goes Leicester Fana Anuku. He runs it in a few metres for good effort as well. Try number six scored. New Zealand up to 36 points. Ball came from the scrum play. Lots of different things set up, but ultimately Richie Mowunga flat to the line. Push past to Damian McKenzie, steps back off his right foot to create an offload to the inside Anton Leonard Brown gets his hands on it switches it back outside to Will Jordan and then after a couple more phases Jordan second receiver gets the ball fires a miss misses four players out straight over to Fainga Nuku on the outside Uruguay can't cover everyone another clean kill from New Zealand inside two or three phases Well, Richie Mwanga has got a moment here just to uh, maybe take a moment and repeat the kick that didn't work last time. It's exactly the same place, isn't it? It really is. It's just what is. you want as a goal kicker, redemption immediately. Well, if that is what happens, ultimately, unless the demons settle in well, for the evening. Well, i bet you that sweet. He gets it. OK, well, we do have a selection of sweets in front of us. There are nutty ones with chocolate wrapped around them and then there are gummies and uh, Paul Grayson's got the gummy or do you want the chocolate one? Uh, neither I'm on a diet. Okay well there we go well extra two points go the way of Moana uh, he is now four from six from the kicking tee as it is now New Zealand 38 Uruguay nil and they've had also had a change also Uruguay they've brought onto the field uh, Felipe Bacchese now when it comes to Uruguay this second 40 is there going to be a little bit of their World Cup is over let's use everyone on the bench everyone just go out there have a good time enjoy yourself keep swinging away something yeah. will come your way don't stop trying yeah and, uh, 
You certainly do don't, don't be embarrassed if they get over the top of the All Blacks, not for any lack of effort. Um, wouldn't it be great if they could get over the line? Well, as you said, they've scored a couple of tries in every match they've played so far. There's no reason why they shouldn't now. A warning to New Zealand to actually control themselves with a shove from uh, Wayne Barnes there. Because at the last scrum where they were going for quite ni uh, nicely, they uh, did end up with quite a few knees on the floor, though they did manage to recover it. But this is a Uruguayan scrum on this occasion. So Felipe Bacchese is onto the field. Uh, actually plays uh, a bit of rugby at US Dance. Okay. Uh, he's uh, come on for Echeverri. And Uruguay have taken Good every height. single player by their wing who's hanging out the Set back, control. Crouch. Uh, directly behind the scrum, and they've put them all out towards the left. Bind. Your Black's quite right, you've left uh, Richie Mwanga Set. hanging out there to cover him just in case. Big shove there from the All Blacks. They get it out quickly Magic. here, Uruguay. Turnover ball from New Zealand. Here they come on the counter. Pushing forward, they've got tries, they want more. Only the six in their pocket so Amazing. far. When it was Italy, they managed to come home with 14. I don't think we're talking about that kind of scoreline. But they are working through the gears. Maybe almost up to fourth that's at the it. moment. Pushing down towards the near side. Lovely stuff. It's the try score from the last occasion in the form of uh, Fana Anuku who pushes on. Still work now from the fresh legs in the form of Takiaho. This is still all black ball inside of the Uruguayan 22. Paul A here at the World Cup. New Zealand ball, couple of phases worked through. They're just slightly pausing now. They're trying not to make any mistakes. So much excitement when they get a big run like that. They made half the length of the field. They're almost having to regather their thoughts and sort of calm themselves as they work through a lot of phases really quickly and actually just make the shape. Now they all swing round to the left-hand side for the attack, but it's slow ball for Roygaard. And all of a sudden, the Uruguayan players manage to get really up into the face of Roygaard. He can't get the pass away. That was good defensive work there by Uruguay, not letting the All Blacks have it all their own way. They've lost the scrum cut half. And you'll have to come back again. Seven phases they've worked through now. Two metres left to travel. You do sometimes think that maybe a little bit of muscle might actually help out the All Blacks a little bit here as they've got the penalty advantage as well. Spat out ball. Not to be on that occasion for Fletcher Newell. As uh, McKenzie goes himself, he dots it down. Try number seven is good. And New Zealand now up to 43. Uruguay nil, who are getting nothing out of this game. Getting squeezed in the set piece, Uruguay from their own putting at the scrum. Eight man shove from New Zealand. Just popped them back at a yard or so. And the New Zealand can get a strike in and win the ball. Played away then to the right hand side as if it was their own scrum. And they planned the move. The ability to get flat and then they went back into midfield. Forwards and backs handling. Pop pass over the top from Will Jordan. Good support. From Williams. Replacement loose head prop. And then after a fair play to Uruguay for managing to slow two or three breakdowns down, they just run out of resources in the end. And Mackenzie goes over. Well, Mackenzie now, that's his second try. And uh, we're just watching as uh, Jordy Barrett goes off the field. Watching very closely whenever Barrett goes off because he did have that knee injury early on. And uh, just making a few changes. I'll just confirm that they haven't flashed up on the screen at the moment and they're just taking the time. Change the All Blacks also. I can see that uh, Ethan Blackadder is onto the field. So Shannon Frizzell has made his way off. So there's going to be a number of changes there. But I'm just waiting for their confirmation of what they are. And um, the shot clock has been paused as well, which I'm not quite sure what that is for either. A uh, little bit of treatment, I think, must have been to uh, Richie Moonga because yeah. he's, he's stepped back up, picked his tee up and... I guess the shot clock will change. Uh, Finlay Christie's come on for Cam Roygaard at nine for the All Blacks. It's always difficult when, you, when you're the up-and-coming nine in a game like this to show your best stuff because you've got to do it. Less is more. I, I think Roygaard's been excellent for the for the period of time that he's been on the pitch on Roy Gard itself it was really interesting Ian Foster when it came talking about him um, it was interesting how it was the reaction of the New Zealand press when Foster said the one thing that Roy Gard really needs to work on is the accuracy of his passing in comparison to a player like an Aaron Smith and everyone's like it's pretty good is he saying that to keep the 22 year old on his toes well what reset the bar you yeah. know, the challenge is laid down by his coach. Be as good as Smith, then try and nudge the bar upwards a little bit. There you 
Eager, the voice of Paul Grayson here with us on the Five Sports section. New Zealand needed a bonus point win tonight to get into the quarterfinals. It looks like that's already well wrapped up with a score of 45 0 against Uruguay. They just missed touch on this near side. And uh, we're just waiting for this Uruguayan attack to get back underway. They put the high ball up and it's gathered by the All Blacks again. The last player on the field you want to get the ball at the moment is Mackenzie, who is playing with an Let's absolute like ball of steam at the moment. And uh, a mistake from the All Blacks that you don't often see. They've overcooked their kick. It's not just gone over the try area. It's gone all the way over the dead ball line. So they're going to come back to where it was kicked to Uruguayan ball. Nice high ball from replacement. Alonso, number 23. All Blacks took it, passed it out to the left, halfway in counter-attack. Fainga Nuka decided to put left boot on it. Just overcooked it, got a bit of topspin on the bounce and went straight off the end of the pitch. Good news for Uruguay, they get a scrum. Almost 15 metres in, 30 metres out from the New Zealand line on the right-hand side of the field. So they've got 45, 50 metres to their left. They'll give it a crack if, it's a reasonable sized if, they can win the scrum. Yeah, and that's exactly the point I was about to make. Okay. Uruguay are really struggling in this scrum at the moment. The replacements that, uh, that All Blacks have brought them just giving them that little bit extra energy. If uh, they're going to use this, they've got to use it quickly. They've also taken off Manuel Diana, the number eight Uruguay. They've brought on Santiago Civetta and they have managed to get that one moving a bit quicker. Not clean passage down the line. New Zealand too quickly up in the faces of the Uruguayan players and they push back towards the half halfway line so they've lost 10 meters in that last mood move 55 meters on the clock and Uruguay are absolutely being pummeled by this wave of black shirts that just keeps coming towards them as they move it towards this near side that's a better bit of work there but from them as they manage to shrug off the first tackle ball being gathered now by Santiago Rata the cast scrum half as he then sends it back towards the middle of the field and they try and work their way up the guts of the park on this occasion but as much as they're inside of the All Blacks half they're still playing at the moment between the 10 and the 22 I kind of think maybe with some of the opportunities they've had they might have built up a little bit of a score by kicking a few penalties but it's a bit pointless now as they go into phase number 7 up 45 nil down on 56 minutes Arata Pushes back towards the middle of the field. The luminous yellow boots of Juan Manuel Rodriguez takes it into contact, loses metres in the process and gets turnover ball. New Zealand come forward. They come on the counter. They have scored so many tries in this World Cup on the counter. Christie with the distribution. Mackenzie flying over the top as he tripped over his own player. A collision there in midfield. I don't know if our referee's going to go back and look at that one. So an all-black player down on the floor. We've had a knock on there by the all-blacks. Playing advantage to Uruguay. Too much going on. Ethan Blackadder is taking a long time to get back to his feet. It's not Blackadder, actually. It's, uh, who is it? Tamati Williams. Who's, uh, I don't know if he's picked up a knock. He's joined the defensive line now. Injuries at this moment for any side who's thinking about quarterfinals will be a huge concern, especially when it's New Zealand who have a very long plane ride to bring any players into camp and uh, get them acclimatised. It's far more difficult for them than it is the European sides who have players on the doorstep. Another huge clash of heads that we actually heard there. And I think referee Wayne Barnes is going to stop it and just wait for a little bit of treatment there to the Uruguayan player who's still down on the ground. And um, I think his nose is in a little bit of discomfort. Yeah, not um, an ideal finish to that passage of play. Some great stuff from Uruguay. They almost got their backs moved from the scrum that we described. Correct. Flat out All Blacks blitz. Just managed to cut them off on the killer pass, but they've moved the ball. Beches, the replacement fly half, has looked excellent, happy to play flat. There's a little bump off the ball there to Puvai. Uh, There's no head contact. He just waiting. Just a penalty. Okay. A penalty on just, just a penalty, no head contact. Just a penalty, no head contact. So they're saying, I think he hit his chest and then it sort of went up towards his face. So that's why there's the confusion from the year of Wyatt's. And the uh, freight has in a support line. Tupu Bay stepped up, got in his face and blocked him when the the pass wasn't made. Came after a, a, a good testing passage of play from uh, from Uruguay. They've earned their penalty. Side. Thanks very much. Okay. They make their way down. So it's still German Kessler who's on at hooker for Uruguay. 
And uh, there was a little bit of a frustration that there wasn't a little bit more there for Uruguay out of that collision. It's another change is made there for the Uruguayans. They bring on the field Juan Manuel Alonso wearing 23. And they take off Nicolas Freitas after he took that collision. It's stolen ball there Forward from right. the All Blacks from the Uruguayan lineup, sent down the field and gathered straight away by Alonso, who's watching the ball bounce three times and gives the All Blacks precious meters uh, in the chase up to get up to it. Uruguay with the ball back inside of their own half of the field between ball the 10 and out. the 22. Yes. They push towards the left hand side of the field. Kessler once again getting involved, but pressure from the All Blacks here. They come on the counter again. They packed it on. Need to gather the ball through the hands of Le Anton Leonard Brown. This time it's going to be taken forward by uh, Takiaho. Push back down the All Blacks line. They don't have numbers as such, but such is their normal speed of ball before they lost it backwards. Vai in the end manages to regather it and sends Caleb Clark off on a run. Finley Christie with the quick distribution out on the wing hanging out was Mwanga. He has to go in and do a little bit of ruck work. And uh, New Zealand have gone through a few phases here as they've managed to attack forward and hold on to the ball inside of the Uruguayan 22. Christie trying to dig that ball. It's so slow though. Uruguayan player probably a little bit lucky he didn't get a penalty there by Wayne Barnes for slowing things down. He was sort of there going, I'm not touching it, I'm getting out of the way as there's numbers out on the far side. Francis. Knocked on ball then by New Zealand. Give a little bit of a gift there to Uruguay. Wrapped up with a bow, it'll be a Uruguayan squad. Just fractionally lost their shape Santiago. at times with all the movement of players Santiago. in New Zealand. Santiago. No, as you yeah. touched on earlier in the game or in the build-up. Sarah Fanganuka's in the centres now. Yeah. Killer Clark's come yeah. onto the wing. Which means there's been a the switch around at 12 and 13. He's made a couple of mistakes in that position with his distribution and kicking the ball dead. Uh, playing a new coup. The big cheer that's going up at the moment around the stadium in Lyon is all for Santiago Arata. He's, he's well known throughout the whole of France for his play uh, in, in cast. And I have to say that all of the Uruguayan fans clearly know all about him. They're all on his feet to thank him as he goes off the field of play. So uh, he clearly has quite made quite an impression, shall we say. It'll be interesting to see where his career goes from here. He scored a belt of a try against Fiji in the 2019 World Cup in that memorable uh, memorable win in Japan. Amazing day for Uruguayan rugby. Well, New Zealand, uh, after scoring just two tries and 30 points in that opening match against France, they've actually since scored 167 points and 25 tries in the past two games. Add on to that the seven tries they've scored so far today. And uh, certainly the All Blacks, you can see, have grown into this tournament. But as uh, you actually said on Five Live earlier this evening, Paul Grayson, Krauts. arguably, how much have New Zealand actually been tested in this pool stage, with the exception of that opening match? I was going to say, game one was a test, wasn't it? And one that they, uh, that they weren't up to at the time. But there's nothing like rugby to get your... Please, confidence please, up, please get you into your systems, step. get better Line understanding. Balance, Sometimes you, uh, those games where everything clicks okay, and everything goes your way and your opposition maybe aren't quite up to the absolute of course we can. Of course levels we can. of some other teams in the tournament, you can gain that confidence, that belief that what you're doing is right. Okay, watch back um, but Like all World Cups, there's very often imbalances in the pool stages. You've got to make sure you take care of business and get out of your pool. And then you are straight into knockout rugby. Could be all over in a week it really could don't worry you're not missing any rugby because they've reset this scrub about four times now they just moved it to the side because they said the turf wasn't good enough so New Zealand 45 euro by nil so a reminder whatever happens in these pools so if uh, the All Blacks ended up as the winners of uh, Pool A they will be taking on the runners up of Pool B that will be on Sunday next week as the All Blacks win a penalty from that scrum and I think uh, Wayne Barnes will just have a word Herman could build towards a card. It's going to be a warning to you. OK. In the first half, we spoke about you can go backwards, you can go forwards. What you can't keep doing is chucking the scrum on the floor, OK? I've seen that too many times now. Next one, you're going to leave, OK? And we'll try someone else. OK, Wayne Barnes quite clear with that. He's had enough of that Uruguayan scrum going down. It's one of the things that people miss and we sometimes forget in rugby. Four and ten. There's nothing wrong with being pushed back in the scrum. Yes, it hurts your team, but it's ten. not a penalty. It's only if you change those dynamics, as Wayne Barnes has said there, in a 
in, a, in an attempt not to get pushed back, he dive on the floor, then it does become the referee's business. Well, Sam Whitelock makes his way off the field on the occasion where he becomes the most capped man at a World Cup, his 23rd Rugby World Cup appearance. He's got a few uh, trophies along the way and the whole of Lyon gets to its feet to salute him as he goes off. Also his 150th cap today, none too shabby a shift, although not fully over just yet. Even the all-black coaching staff get to their feet as he comes off the field of play. And uh, in amongst all of that as well, Bowden Barrett comes onto the field and Richie Mwanga makes his way off. One of those days, uh, I think a couple of weeks, where I think Sam Whitelock just uh, keeps on breaking records and we'll reflect him in a moment because here comes his side now on the attack. They managed to win the lineup five metres away from the Uruguayan try line, hunting down an eighth try for themselves now. Christie looking for the ball, can't see it. There's a real contest going on. Uruguay smell blood. They're going over the top. Has that one gone over? Not lying on the ball. This is anyone's ball. This is a messy run. It's going to still cough up on the black side. Eventually, it is going to appear, but you're quite brilliantly to slow it down, but they do finally give away the penalty. <laughs> Eventually. Well, two men in, three men in, four men in, five men in. They're slowing the ball down, but they're losing a man a second there to the breakdown Uruguay. Um, it was on on the left-hand side if... New Zealand could have got the ball out. There's been another change. I don't know whether you mentioned it, whether Richie Moran has gone off. Bowden Barrett has come on. Damian McKenzie moves into the fly half roll and Barrett slides in to full back. So the, the hits keep on coming from New Zealand. Probably um, one of the most feared backs of the last five, six, seven years. Bowden Barrett, no matter what position he plays in, they a miracle worker at times. Well, the uh, DJ has seen an opportunity inside of the stadium to spin a few tracks as there's a bit of a treatment to one of the Uruguayan players on the floor. They're also going to make a change in the front row anyway. Uh, it's actually a penalty that the All Blacks won there. And to be fair, Wayne Barnes, he referees quite brilliantly. There are times, though, in a game like this where perhaps he lets the odd thing go. And I think he let a few maybe slide by there before he actually decided to blow his whistle. I'll just leave that there then from you, so I think. Okay. <laughs> um, listen, but Wayne Barnes has been it's the not best, a bad thing. The I best think he was referee. Trying to... He has he has empathy. Yes. Uh, with the with that's a wonderful with the way players, of saying empathy. And and the game, uh, and he would be able to explain absolutely every decision uh, to the letter of the law, and I, and I think that as a part of his makeup, the understanding a of the absolute detail. Um, obviously with his legal background there's nothing he misses but he does understand the game he does understand the occasion he doesn't want to send the Argentin uh, the Uruguayan loose head off it gives him an opportunity to go and scrum scrum better scrum different he could have quite easily just waved a yellow card but he didn't they've just brought um, Mateus Benitez on for Uruguay and if you get a close-up shot of him he looks a bit like he's wearing like NFL pads underneath his shirt which uh, I, I know you have a bit of padding on there as a front row but uh, it's quite impressive um, I'm sure it's all totally legal as well because everything has to be approved of course if you're there in any sort of padded situation but uh, it's clearly fresh fresh pillow as he uh, comes onto the field for it gets absolutely pummeled now coming in to this scrum. So Uruguay on a warning here at the scrum as the ball does eventually come in from New Zealand and uh, it crabs slightly to the side. It's gathered in the end at the back by Jacobson, pushed out to McKenzie, spun out towards the wide and it's going to be Jordan who slots it down in the corner. Too easy. Try number eight there, scored by the All Blacks as uh, Jordan goes over in the corner. And there's the fourth right-hand variation play from that midfield scrum under the post. Legit scrum from Uruguay, no penalty given. But the quality of the handling, the movement of the players, the little bit of deception to mean that they get a clean walk in after a great set of hands from Bowden Barrett to give Jordan a walk in on the right hand side. Just fantastic skills, all pre planned. Same patterns as before. This time it's Leonard Brown gives a return ball to McKenzie, who would have been mowing her in the first half. He's got Barrett out of his shadow. And as the last man steps in, Barrett taking give. Jordan scores untouched. So as Jordan slides over, 
about four metres out. It's now Damian McKenzie who steps up to take kicking duties. He's taken that ball fully, what, 36 metres out? It's right over by the right-hand touch line. This is now a massive kick. How far would you take them back if it was that far? Uh, so it's it would about be, four, three metres out from the far side touch. Yeah, it'd be no more than a yard over the uh, over the 22. What He's a good shot. It. Well, he fancied it. And the All Blacks have gone well over the half ton there. They're on 52. Uruguay still on nil. And uh, Uruguay, they're not a bad team at all. It's just the All Blacks are a lot better, I think is the nicest way to put it. And this is a game that's certainly actually been all about Solid set piece from the All Blacks. Great counter-attacking rugby. Uruguay, just with their little flashes. They've been really good, really good for their money at the breakdown. Um, slightly tiring in this second half, you have to say. Uh, but they just need a few more cards to be able to play from the pack. And at the moment, they've just run out. On the chair on for them at scrum half as he just tracks around as the All Blacks work their way forward, looking for their exit from their own half. Christie looks up ball down running forward by Luke Jacobson on his 18th cap today that's more one for the future don't expect to see so much of him at the knockout stage as Uruguay gather between the 10 and the 22 high one put up this time from the Uruguayans lands back inside of the All Blacks half flying through the air goes Christie who falls over in the process of gathering but a little bit of kick tennis there in reply then from Uruguay I haven't really seen too much of that from them as the spinning run comes in from Samasoni Takiyaho and uh, they've got numbers on this near side. The All Blacks, here they come flying down this left side, still waiting. It's going to be another try for Leicester. Van Aranuku, he goes over in the corner, and Uruguay have got nothing. Heads are down. They're slowly trudging their way back behind the try line after what has been a pretty glorious World Cup for them where they have done wonderful things. They've been scoring tries against other side. They've got nothing against the All Blacks and they've got no answers either. No, they've fully run out of steam. Emptied their bench. And that gives you a boost, but so have the All Blacks. Lovely intervention again from, from Barrett. Leonard Brown carrying the ball, controlling the traffic. And then big old Leicester on the left wing finds himself in his natural position. He's a finisher. He's an absolute monster of a bloke. No, he's been in a lot of good positions so far this evening. Has uh, Leicester Fanauku, the uh, Crusaders wing, who's now slotted into the centre. It's only a sixth cap this evening as well as we approach the 70th minute mark in this fixture. This second half is we've actually flown through, and it's mainly flown from the brilliance of the All Blacks as Mackenzie has now got another kick. This time it's two metres out from this near side. So he's slotted one from the other. Now he's brought it back to this. He's got a real rocket on it to get a huge amount of power through it. And he slotted that one and he made that look easy. Great shot. The, the, uh, the number, the distance number flashed up on the screen before he kicked that. He's taken the ball so far back. It's 46 metres to clear the crossbar. Cleared it with ease. Kicking to your thing, Paul Grayson. When it comes to taking them from those kind of corners, if there's any sort of uh, young boys or young girls who are out there listening and watching someone like Damian McKenzie slot those with ease, I know you can say practice makes perfect, but uh, what else can you say about learning to kick around those tight corners? Listen, when you're growing up and you're young, distance doesn't matter. Accuracy first, hit something small, power will come. There you go. There's a lot of people who pay a lot of money for that kind of advice. And we're giving it to you for free here on Five Live as long as you paid uh, your license fee. Of course, right. Then. Moving on. New Zealand 59, Uruguay now 69 minutes on the clock. Now, coming up this weekend, there is a lot as the ball goes out of play on this near side, and we'll just wait for them to build a Uruguayan line out. Don't forget that oh, tomorrow, we're going to be live on okay, Five Live okay, okay, France against the Italy. Cap, the final match of Pool A, of course. That one back here with myself and Paul Grayson here in this stadium as uh, France will try and top the pool and make passage through their own home World Cup on Saturday. You've got Wales against Georgia, 2 o'clock start in Nantes on Sports Extra. You've got England against Samoa, 4.45 in Lille. That one will be on 5 Live with Chris Jones, Matt Dawson and Cat Merchant. And then still on 5 Live, it's a biggie and Paul B, Ireland against Scotland. 
kicks off at 8 o'clock in Paris. That one with Andrew Cotter, Johnny Beatty and Tommy Bowe. As we just watched this attack from the All Blacks, are running through Sunday in a moment. Caleb Clark on the ball, Christie in the middle of the field. On the halfway off, penalty on, for New Zealand and Christie wants to take it quickly. No interest in anything else. Spun it out towards the far side. Will Jordan hacks it on. He's chasing his own bouncing ball. Uruguay have it. They've got to take it over their own line now. Absolutely hunted down by three black shirts in the process. They'll have to come back. The last thing they want is a scrum. That is what they've got. Yeah, play from another turnover from the All Blacks. Get the ball to the outside. The chip over from Will Jordan. And then fantastic pace from Bacchese to get back and collect the ball. Jordan is no slouch. He managed to hold him off over 20 metres. Well, Fletcher Newell is down receiving a little bit of treatment at the moment, so this scrum is going to take a few moments for them to form because the Fletcher Newell was already a replacement tight head already for the All Blacks, so maybe a little bit of okay. chopping and changing as he just okay, gets back scrum. to his feet. So a reminder now on Sunday, we're in the final throws of the pool stage then. Pool D, Japan against Argentina. Who's going to join England in the quarterfinals? Pool B will be Tonga against Romania. That one's a 4.45, not a lot on that one. And then we finish off the whole pool stage in Toulouse, an 8 o'clock start for Fiji against Portugal. Conor Matamara and Tolson Tollett will be there for that one. And worth saying that that one, of course, will be the nail expected in the Australian coffin, that they will be out of the World Cup at the pool stage. Right then. Keep the height. Right then, the three-time champions, the All Blacks is what we're watching this evening. We've got 59 points against Uruguay's nil. 71 minutes now on the clock. Finley Christie spinning the ball around in his hands. Uruguay been on a warning at the scrum. They did actually manage to hold up their last one, but there's a bit of a nudge on here again by New Zealand. They're holding it at the base. Jacobson in the end picks up. Miscommunication from Christie was in the wrong place, and they lose about eight metres in the process. Not clean set, please, then. For the world number four side, waiting to gather the ball is Vai, who's now got a big bandage around his head after his efforts from the first half. This time Takiaho has it. And at what was a very solid platform, is just looking at slightly messy from the All Blacks, but part of that is credit to the Uruguayan defence and slowing this ball down. Advantage Warning there, Uruguayan player lying on the wrong side, and this time Wayne Barnes gives that decision very quickly. So, penalty advantage then for New Zealand. Seven metres to go to get to that Uruguayan line. Hunting down a hat-trick comes Vanayuku. Not to be on this occasion, needs a little bit of support from a few more players. One metre left to go, nine, who's nine, gonna get it? Nine. They're lining up on either side. They're gonna go towards the right. The forwards try and go forward, is it over? Wayne Barnes says yes. Just waiting for confirmation of the number on the shirt of whoever had it right at the bottom there. And it looks like it's Tamati Williams who's gonna go over. Two drives for the line there. When you're getting close and it's late in the game, Every player got eyes for the try line. You still need people to do the selfless acts to clear the rooks, to create the space. He didn't go for it first time, Williams. Recycled the ball, got back on his feet. And he got a second crack, picked from the back of the breakdown. Bound onto on the on the right-hand side. Strong latch. I think it was Fainga Nuku. The wing come centre, <laughs> driving him over the line. Good score from the replacement, loose head, switching it up at goal kicking. Damian McKenzie having a break, and Bowden Barrett having a go. How important is it for a player like a Bowden Barrett to get a few kicks under his belt? No practice like match practice. Full of the training advice this evening. Quite like it, Paul Grayson. <laughs> As uh, Bowden Barrett steps up. He can kick those in his sleep, and he may as well have been asleep for that one because it was a straightaway too easy. 66 points to nil as we close in on the last uh, six minutes now of this fixture. And um, interesting here, they have had to take uh, Fletcher Newell off the field. So uh, just trying to see who they brought back on. I think they brought back on Tunga Fassi. Um, yes, he was reluctantly climbing over the advertising yes. boards to get back on the field. <laughs> It's a, it's, a, it's a mild evening here, so he won't have completely seized up. But yeah. um, It's one of those ones, you get to take a sit down. He, he came off really early in the first half as well. It was about four or five minutes in that Tunga Fassi actually came off the field. So he has been sat down for a good half hour. 
and now he's asked to come back onto the field. Uh, so hopefully Fletcher Newell is okay, but he did receive quite a little bit of treatment the last time he had a scrum. And uh, again, a reminder that it's not straightforward if New Zealand have an injury now as we get to the end of this tournament to bring a player out. It's about 10 days to get over sort of jet lag and everything to actually get back into the mix and train well. Yeah, I mean, anybody who's travelled overseas that distance just for fun, it takes a while, doesn't it? Even if you're just wandering around uh, Windsor Castle, when you come back, it is exhausting to try and get yourself acclimatised to play what will be knockout rugby by then. Um, it's pretty tough. Ten, ten. Well, just a reminder, of course, uh, the England team that was out earlier it will be George Ford starting at 10 tomorrow. Oh, on Saturday even against Samoa with uh, Owen Farrell at 12 but the big headline from that press conference that Jack Willis is out of the World Cup he picked up a neck injury in their match against Chile he's not going to recover in time for the rest of the tournament and uh, the England head coach Steve Borthwick has said he will call up a replacement but he is not going to announce who it is just yet lots of speculation flying around about which player that will be what position they will actually be as uh, New Zealand have the ball on the Uruguayan 22, already uh, 10 tries they've scored here this evening in Lyon, as we see a bit of a bait through from Blackadder, unable to connect there with Caleb Clark, no knock on though in the process, just loose on the floor, hoovered up once again by New Zealand, 66 points to nil, 76 minutes on the clock, Christy, nice pass back inside, Uruguay did well to make sure that that wasn't a walk through to the line. Kane, the captain, he's done well. Remember, recovering from his back spasm as they managed to get numbers out on this near side. Not going to be on this occasion because there wasn't quite enough gas there by Summer Sozi Takiaho. But in the end, they work around the outside and it will be a hat trick for Leicester Fana Aruku. He goes over for his third try, the 11th then for New Zealand, as once again they've gone over 70. New Zealand 71, Uruguay now. Two nice little bits from replacement scrum off Finley Christie there. Dancing around the side of the breakdown, complete awareness of what he was trying to do. One, a little reverse flick uh, back inside to Will Jordan lurking, covered well eventually by the Uruguayan defence. And another one, a short ball to um, Ethan Blackadder off his shoulder. Those penetrating runs, though, narrow up the defence. And when it was time to swing it wide, even though Taikeaho didn't quite have the gas on the outside, no, <laughs> um, what he did do was present the ball extremely well they cleared it out and it was a, yeah, a little pick and drive from Fengo Nuku to, to complete his hat trick Fana Anuku has made 205 metres in this fixture um, not a bad evening's work you have to say it's one of those evenings where I'm highly expecting it to be as we just wait for this kick from Bowden Barrett that again is too easy for him as they rack up to 73 I'm highly expecting the player of the match to be a back this evening and it's not the forwards have done anything wrong the set pieces work beautifully but when you're running in tries left right and centre it's going to be a back that gets the credit yeah and we've got a stats board away to our left meters made the All Blacks 1170 over well over a kilometre ball in hand ball carried that is a lot of metres huge amount of running and uh, Uruguay as I said the breakdown's kind of their thing but it's really faded and they've just needed a bit more from that unfortunately set piece in particular their lineup functioned pretty well in the first half but it hasn't been anything to write about in the second as we move into the final two minutes here in Lyon 73 nil, and here's a big breakaway from Barrett who's got fresh legs he's got Christie with him crossfield kick from Barrett no idea what he was trying to do there but the execution was poor we don't say that often like a knife through butter Bowden Barrett hitting the short line pace of a winger straight up the middle and I think it was Damian McKenzie on his right hand side calling for the ball Barrett went for a little outside of the boot banana kick I've seen on you. and by the look of it he used a bit too much sock in that one how annoyed is a coach when a player tries to do something like that Barrett is smiling the game is gone does it matter secretly no but you know you're going to tell him yes it'll be the look of Ian Foster of don't do that again right then the ball has been sent back then by Uruguay, gathered by New Zealand again. We're in the final minute. Just What's going to happen just with on. this ball? Knock on Is advances. it going to be try number 12? Bryce in, Bryce. And away, and away. Good work. There's a 
Fazio Fazio one in hands lock. going in. Comes away. Barrett has it now. Soft hands pass towards the far side as they try and use the space available to them. New Zealand. They run out of grass out on the right hand wings. They're going to bring it back inside now. Christie is there waiting, as is Mackenzie. Mackenzie decides to hack on himself to give Christie more time to get back to his feet. Now it's Barrett. He decides Thanks to off. miss a couple of players out. Looks once again for Lestefana Uku, who is uh, quite the player of the moment for the time being on a hat trick of tries of the 11 scored now by New Zealand and uh, a penalty for Uruguay clock is gone and off they go not interested in anything else how much do New Zealand want to stop this as it's pushed out towards the far side wing is the whole of Leon going to be on its feet no New Zealand get the ball back they're not feeling at all generous kind but it's been knocked on in the end doesn't matter that is the match Full time then, New Zealand 73, Uruguay nil, and New Zealand were not in any way interested in allowing any kind of party here for Uruguay, any kind of special send off. This is all about them getting ready, saying, Here come the quarterfinals, we're in, we'll see you there. A fitting end there that Uruguay came up with a turnover in their own 22 with the clock in the red, total refusal once the penalty given to finish the game with anything other than another swing of their arms try and land a punch right at the death they got away down the left hand side unfortunately as the stadium got to their feet couldn't quite finish it off they will point at the scoreboard and say we're better than Italy we didn't concede 90 odd points they kept New Zealand quiet for 20 minutes played their hearts out ultimately clearly New Zealand way better in all areas but uh, for Uruguay it's not necessarily it's the first time they've played the All Blacks in the modern era at a World Cup what a day for them what they've learnt today they will take home and implement against lesser teams and uh, their curve will only be upwards we did say a little bit earlier it's hard to say who did and didn't play well for the All Blacks when it's that kind of a, a scoreline but Damian McKenzie out there I mean he was just loving his rugby and they're showing off and there's executing brilliant skill and he was executing brilliant skills of the highest quality games like that can get very scrappy very quickly McKenzie um, I mean it's the halfbacks and the decision makers who can keep a game neat by asking people to do their jobs over and over again but the but the highlights some of the touches some of the bits of skill particularly the Will Jordan trying the first half from Damian McKenzie that's up where with the best you'll see. Well, both teams just shaking hands at the moment. We're going to take the player of the match interview in a few moments time. Just a reminder that Paul and I will be back here tomorrow night for that France-Italy game. But confirmed once again, New Zealand are into the quarterfinals of the Rugby World Cup. Whether they finish top of the pool or second place is yet to be decided because of the second game. But it is Damian McKenzie who has won player of the match. And we will be hearing from him shortly. He's just taking his position uh, with our broadcast colleagues as they just bring over the presentation of the uh, trophy to give to him. He's going to have a few photos taken with the mascot as well, which is very nice. But Mackenzie wearing 15 tonight did it with a plum and just proof that players can move from 10 to 15 with ease if required. And that debate will continue when we watch England playing Samoa. Of course, it is Freddie Stewart who will be starting wearing 15 for England as we now just wait to hear now from Damian McKenzie, who will be speaking to our broadcast colleagues. The MasterCard player of the match is Damian McKenzie. Presenting the trophy is 12-year-old Ugo. As 12-year-old Ugo hands over the trophy. Damien, congratulations. Um, a fantastic individual performance, a great team performance, but two tries, two assists. I mean, you must be very happy about this. Yeah, I think it was a really enjoyable game. Um, pretty free-flying. Uh, it took us a long while, long time to break um, Uruguay, to be honest. Uh, they defended us really well, and, and then we managed to have put some points on the board. So, yeah, really proud of the win and hit from the lads. Into the quarterfinals you go. You must be, uh, you know, happy days. That's like a good place to be now. For sure. Um, you know, we've got to where we want to uh, want to be. We know we've got to get better from this week and, and move on to the quarters, whoever we play. And um, you're really, really excited for the week to come. 
And what about that little bit of a, uh, you know, the the pass, the little offload uh, just down the sideline? Talk us through that quickly. Um, got pretty lucky, to be honest. Uh, they bounced up to me and placed like Will Jordan on the inside scoring tries. So um, yeah, lucky that one bounced my way. Congratulations, thanks, you. Thanks, mate. Sorry. Congratulations there to the player of the match there, Damian McKenzie. Paul Grayson, was he a little bit lucky? Uh, play the cards that you're dealt. The ball popped up. He had less than an inch to move in at full tilt. From that point on, uh, all skill, just a magnificent piece of skill. Great game, two tries, two assists, kicked a couple of beautiful conversions. At the end, humble textbook self-deprecating interview from an excellent player okay so are New Zealand going to top the pool or is it France that will overtake them so as it stands New Zealand they're top of the shop they've got 15 points it's got France in second place on 13 Italy in third on 10 myself and Paul back here in Lyon tomorrow night at 8 o'clock to wrap this pool up don't forget there is a fresh brand new Rugby Union Daily heading into your inboxes right now and it's a special ahead of a special weekend because it will be coming from the outskirts of Paris as Scotland prepare for Mission Impossible against Ireland special guest with Chris Jones is the Scotland head coach Gregor Townsend as he'll be discussing his team selection with Ali Price starting at nine as well as the sides approach as to whether Finn Russell will be banging over any drop goals at the start Dad. Right then, that is it from myself and Paul Grayson. Thank you very much. Have a lovely evening. Bonsoir. Bonsoir. See you tomorrow. And we will see you tomorrow. Good evening. Bye bye.